Hey everybody and welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is part of the monthly webinar series organized by the New Hampshire Food Alliance. The purpose of the webinars are to highlight the diversity of food system work happening in the state, share knowledge, connect network partners, and build relationships. All webinar attendees are muted and will remain muted for the duration. If you want to comment or ask a question, there is a chat icon usually located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Click on that to open the chat box and type in your comment or question. We will pause at the end of the first speaker to answer any questions and then again at the end of the webinar for a longer question and comment period. We will relay your questions and comments to the presenters. The webinar is also being recorded and will be able to be accessed through the New Hampshire Food Alliance website. So today's webinar, Indigenous New Hampshire Foodways and History, will feature leaders of the New Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective. Presenters are Svetlana Peskova, Associate Professor of Anthropology and Women's Studies at the University of New Hampshire, and Paul and Denise Puglio from the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abenaki people. Solana, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, my name is Svetlana Peshkova and I'm a core member of the uh, Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective and an associate professor of anthropology at UNH. Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective is a collaboration between tribal leaders of the Kawasak Band of the Pinnacle Abenaki people and other indigenous peoples, the faculty, staff and students at the University of New Hampshire and local community members, volunteers, educators and activists. Our aim is to contribute to public education by decolonizing New Hampshire history, or by, in other words, reframing it from an indigenous perspective. Through critical research and analysis of archival material, existing publications, town histories, and a direct correspondence with living descendants, we map indigenous sites of cultural and historical significance, write about local indigenous <clears throat> history and present, and work on establishing Native American and Indigenous Studies minor at UNH and also create various materials for public education. Indigenous uh, knowledge and heritage are important educational resources that could enrich our communities on professional and personal levels. Our local communities reside on the traditional lands and waterways of the Abenaki, Pinnacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present, who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. Our collective is an important educational intervention into an ongoing effort to build an enduring relationship between various non-Indigenous communities and local Indigenous communities in the state of New Hampshire. To ensure ecological and cultural sustainability, we must come together to learn about Indigenous heritages locally and globally. Speaking from personal experience as an educator, I see firsthand a lack of knowledge that Indigenous heritage has in New Hampshire. For example, in the fall 2018, I taught an honors course at UNH, which enrolled 18 honors students. These are our best students. Not a single one of them could recollect any sustainable knowledge about indigenous heritage that they have received in their previous education. This signals a problem to me, a problem of lack of knowledge and recognition of indigenous heritage on the part of the students and educators at various levels. This in turn propels our collective in an ongoing collaborative work that aims to address this problem. UNHCC, or Indigenous New Hampshire Collaborative Collective, has a vision, and the first part of it is to foster public knowledge about local Indigenous heritage by introducing programmatic changes at and producing educational materials for public schools and colleges. Second, we want to ensure a symbolic recognition of Indigenous history and present contributions of Native Americans to the well-being of our state and to the wider community. And finally, we want to create a community center, which would be a place for community building and education for all residents of the state. There are several words and phrases that became commonplace for our collective. One of them is indigenous peoples, uh, a phrase that we used to refer to the diverse local traditional inhabitants who occupied and stewarded the land and its resources for at least 12,000 years. 
Another term is Western knowledge, which we use to refer to the pro-colonial body of knowledge that omits recognition of local and other indigenous peoples' complex and diverse cultures and histories, and their impacts on and contributions to the global society prior, during, and after colonial settlements. To address this lack of knowledge, we deploy a decolonial approach, which calls for a critical understanding of the underlying assumptions, motivations, and values that inform pro-colonial perspectives on local histories and science. This allows us to be more attuned to alternative histories, stories, and facts, including an indigenous perspective that challenges existing historical and sociocultural narratives in this state and elsewhere. The collective's work rests on three pillars or three principles, public education, restorative justice activism, and local focus. Projects that we work on are meant to benefit all residents of New Hampshire, indigenous or not, and are publicly accessible. For example, we visit local schools and historical societies in various public events, including powwows and conferences. Our activism is driven by values of restorative justice and community building in the state of New Hampshire. The focus of our work is always local. The value of restorative justice cannot be overstated. Creating knowledge and building relations requires participatory pedagogy within the collective and between the collective and others. We're purposeful in our learning with and from each other and not about others and call on everyone to adopt this approach. We rely heavily on collaborative work, which takes long hours and incorporates vetting of all sources, collectives consensus, and recognition that any knowledge that we produce or create is dynamic and so it can change. We need to be open to challenging our own views in order to create change in our local communities. In the efforts to decolonize local histories and heritage, we rely heavily on decolonial methodology that a Maori scholar, Linda Tuhawai Smith, defines as an effort to, more, to, uh, effort to a more critical understanding of the underlying assumptions, motivations, and values that inform research practices. Our work in community outreach actively bring in and lift up indigenous voices, support indigenous issues, and work against narratives that ignore or silence indigenous history and presence. We value storytelling, which helps to preserve histories, traditions, beliefs, and values for generations. Our collective utilizes storytelling through parts of our online virtual map that I will refer to as a story map from now and on, with places of indigenous significance, we utilize storytelling and podcasting and in short films on YouTube, such as the one about the Mount Kersage Indian Museum in New Hampshire. We also work on indigenizing history and theory by delinking and reassociating or reconnecting places and ideas with indigenous communities. We advocate indigenous representing. Indigenous people have a right to represent themselves. They speak for themselves and on their own terms. This occurred, for example, in Durham, New Hampshire last fall during an event called Ask an Indigenous Person, led by our Indigenous collaborators. We work by reframing issues surrounding Indigenous communities in a way that asserts that Indigenous knowledge deserves equal respect. We insist that each perspective has a value and there is not a single absolute truth when it comes to history. Finally, sharing knowledge with for, by, and among indigenous peoples and others benefits the larger New Hampshire community. We share our knowledge and research with the broader public through online write-ups, social media, story maps, podcasts, visits, and talks. Following indigenous values, the knowledge we share is free, accessible, and collaborative. We do not profit from the knowledge produced. Now some examples of our work. In the fall 2018, the collective produced a short YouTube clip surveying UNH students' opinions about changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, created some educational resources for the state lawmakers on this issue, and then finally, in the spring 2019, we co-organized a public forum that discussed establishing Indigenous Peoples Day at UNH. In the fall 2018, the collective attended New Hampshire's Council for Social Studies Conference in Manchester, where we conducted a workshop for local public schools educators focusing on educational resources we produce. But more importantly, more importantly, we listened to the educators talk about their needs and abilities to learn and share indigenous heritage and history at New Hampshire public schools.
In January, March 2019, the collective created and held an exhibit at the UNH Diamond Library. The exhibit introduced visitors to the indigenous naming, views, stories, and histories of the Woba Adenok, known to English speakers as the White Mountains in New Hampshire. If you Google Indigenous New Hampshire or enter indigenousnh.com as a URL address, you will get an access to our getaway website that provides write-ups on Indigenous history and heritage and a link to the story map, an online program that allows one to virtually travel the places of Indigenous significance in the state. The website also has links to our podcasts and social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The next slide is an image of our getaway website. The next slide is an image of our story map that has 30 entries at this point and is growing. The next slide will introduce you to our Indigenous collaborators, Denise and Paul Pulios, who will continue this podcast. Kwai everyone, Kwai Niedelbach, uh, welcome friends. Uh, my name is Paul Pulio, the Sagamo of the Cossack Band of Penneker Kanabnaki people, and with me is uh, my wife Denise. Hi, I'm Denise Pulio. I'm Sagamo Squaw, or head female speaker of the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Gabnaki people. We're going to start off today um, with a, a statement that's always given by Indigenous people that we're the keepers and caretakers of this uh, earth mother. And uh, this is part of a presentation that we do that covers all of our food waste, but this is uh, primarily centered on the plant world today. Uh, our primal connection goes back to about 13,000 years ago. Uh, the paleo indigenous people here, which we believe were our uh, uh, distant ancestors, were here 13,000 years ago. And roughly a thousand years ago or so, we're not quite sure the exact time period, but agriculture started to creep in to our culture. So there was a strong connection between the people and our world place. Uh, we consider ourselves not by these names you hear us today, we consider ourselves Elmenbach or human beings. In this world, which is, uh, we consider uh, New Hampshire today, was Nandakina, or our world place. And in that place, we maintain the forest and we did various techniques to maintain it for us for slash and burn, burning to take clear the, uh, the pathways and created fields and trails and we deliberately planted and took advantage of the way things grew. So if we slashed and burnt, we would see that blueberries and, and strawberries and, and raspberries would come into those fields after we did that and it would bring other animals into our environment to uh, share those resources and we shared those animals as well. Now, when we look at our, our culture, uh, we're not gonna dwell too much on this, but we look at the four seasonal time periods and we also recognize that because we're hunter gatherers, we did migrate. And this debate whether or not a main village <clears throat> in the right location could sustain us at all times, but we had times when we wanted to hunt moose and we had winter hunting camps. We had late uh, winter camps for making maple syrup and there were main villages and there seashore villages. And we're gonna talk mainly about those that were in the growing season time period. So into our plant world. People don't think of oak trees as being an important food resource, but nuts of all sorts were harvested selectively for their taste. Uh, today we see a lot of red oak uh, and black oak here, but swamp oak, the white oaks, uh, the ones that had less tannin and burr oaks, were deliberately um, uh, cultivated when we had an opportunity because we found that they tasted better. And these burr oaks and white oaks were very important. Not to mention there were the importance of all the other nuts, this whole area was uh, filled with hickory and butternut and beech and chestnut and hazelnuts. All of these were abundant. Each one of them had a place in the harvesting process for us. And sometimes some of these could still be gathered in the springtime. So it made it easy for us to find acorns even in the early spring that didn't get uh, germinated and we could still use those. Acorns mainly were dried and made into flour 
or a mixture of water compounded and the oils would be separated with the uh, water and the heating of that, the two products together. So we look at our paleo ancestors and we can look at, uh, at the Ice Age movies. We were crazy like that squirrel. We loved acorns and it was an important part of our resources. The, uh, the nuts that we do highlight are the acorns, walnuts, hazelnuts, chestnuts, and you can see that list. Uh, butternut was very big here, but today you'd be hard pressed to find any. When we get into uh, green vegetables, this is a little more interesting. Uh, because it's so seasonal, green vegetables are, were, were important, but it was really critical to harvest them at the right time. Milkweed had to be harvested at the earliest growth sign, much like asparagus. You don't want it to go beyond the point of, of edibility and it gets fibrous and tough. Same thing occurs with the ferns. The fiddleheads and the, uh, and the cinnamon ferns were often taken very early because they were still tender enough to eat. The, uh, today we only focus on the fiddleheads, but cinnamon ferns, which are a little more fibrous, were also eaten uh, as a regular snack. Here's a picture of some fiddleheads, and I, I could say today is now the time to go to the, the better grocery stores. You'll find fiddleheads just like you would find asparagus. It's, it's very tasty, and it can be well used as cold or a heated uh, vegetable. What people didn't realize was there were many other plants that, as hunter-gatherers, we were able to figure out that wood lilies and Canada lilies and Turks cap lily could be harvested in the fall after the growth period. And they had many nutrients, nutrients, and they were very sweet in the fall. And these became another part of our diet. Here's what a wood lily would look like if you find one in the forest. Uh, other various roots, which are really very interesting and more interesting to us because they're more accessible and more easily harvested, are the sunchokes, which we take, today call Jerusalem artichokes. But in the old days, this is what we call them. And Groundnuts were the other one. These were harvested when they were dormant and they had the highest potential value for the fall, winter, and early spring. Here's what the sun chokes look like. We, at our uh, tribal headquarters, we have a very highly controlled population of this. It's one of those plants that if you allow it, it will take over everything. But it is a wonderful tuber and we, only two days ago we had a meal with uh, venison and the sunchokes. So uh, it's an interesting alternative to potatoes and it's very nutritious. It's mm -hmm. High in inulin. It's a good medicinal plant to help um, stay off diabetes as well. The other one is uh, ground nuts. Um, and it, it looks like a sweet pea in a lot of ways. And if you find them, you can pull them up. They're also edible by just boiling, just like the, uh, the sun chokes. <clears throat> These are the, this is a list of plants that we know we gathered as hunter gatherers. And the reason we know this is true is people say, well, how do you know we actually harvested this or that? Well, in our language, if we can find references in our language about certain plants, then we know that we actually harvested them or cultivated them. And so here's a list of some of the other plants or in, in a list so you can see that language does support the contention that we did actually um, maintain these plants. What people don't realize, and this is an interesting part of our culture, is things like cattails were very important. When we speak about uh, gardening, we have to reflect that gardening in the colonial construct thinks of a plowed field, uh, a definable thing bounded by stone walls. And yet that's, it's more than that. Because our word for garden is medicine field. Nibi wozon ki kon on. It means a medicine field. So food is medicine. And the root word there is nibi. And nibi wozon means medicine. So we looked at plants and gardens as a place that medicines came to, to nourish us. Whereas 
colonial femme, as we call habito, which is a loan word from the French, meaning he's just a, he's a guy that plows fields. So when you look at those two constructs, we looked at our gods as separate. And when we look at, when we sowed, it was kika winino, which means we actually did sow the soil, the plant. And this is much later than we would have been harvesting things like swamps and other water areas where we find these medicinal plants. So when we talk about gardens, we look at things like even the wetlands as being a garden. Later on, started to really focus on growing in a specific area were obviously the corn, beans, squash, pumpkins. At this point, the sun chokes and sunflowers were already there. So more selectively and no one really grew. What has been documented is we planted them with a center mound. We used the, the corn in the middle. We used the uh, beans to grow around the corn and that would be hanging onto the corn. And the squash and the pumpkins would grow around the mound because the varieties we had had prickly vines which kept most animals out of there from nibbling like the, like the deer. And it also provided moist con moisture control. Now, everybody knows about Plymouth Plantation. They heard all the stories about Thanksgiving and how we taught the colonials to use fish for fertilizer. We had uh, various fish, which we called garden fish. And you say, well, what's that mean? Well, a garden fish is a fish that wasn't suitable for normal eating or drying because too many bones or they just didn't have the right flesh. So it wasn't a waste to take something that we got like a sucker fish, to use them into them and put it in for fertilizer it was a, a logical thing. How do we learn to do this? Generations and generations of experimentation, I'm sure, but subtleties like putting small rocks in, in the mounds on the outside for heat absorption, kind of a passive solar approach, also increased our production in the germination of the seeds because we had a little mound that was more heated because of the rocks. We didn't have the little dome things that you see today over your squash and pumpkins. We actually just used these rocks and it would absorb the heat. This is a picture of some various <clears throat> corn varieties. I'm sure that you look at the first one on the bottom, it, it doesn't look like corn, but the original uh, grains were kind of random like this. And we think the original corns that we had were probably like the lower left of the picture. The flint corns, the harder corns, kind of evolved over time, what we call Indian corn today, you see on the right. The beans, wonderful beans. Beans of all varieties were uh, uh, developed, exchanged uh, through different uh, trade routes. We all shared beans and beans became quite uh, popular because the multiple little varieties and they don't cross pollinate as well as like corn does. So we had very distinct types of beans. And the squash is the same thing. Quite a few varieties of squash, most of which we still grow today, uh, heirlooms and otherwise, and they hold up extremely well. We still have in storage some of the squash we grew from last year. Let's get back to those three sisters again. Uh, these, it's important to emphasize this because this is something you can do at home. And we encourage uh, schools to, to teach uh, the students, you know, everybody grows beans in your little classroom, you know, before the school year's out and they take them home and we don't know what happens with them, but we'd like to see more schools actually developing uh, planting techniques like we used and start this in the, in the beginning of the year. And so when the students return back to school in the fall, they can actually reap the benefits of what they did in the spring. And they could use the same techniques like is described here to build these little gardens and see if they actually do work. And we've been asking, uh, we know we did this at uh, Mount Cursage Indian Museum. We did it at the Children's Museum in Dover a couple of years ago. And we know quite a few schools are actually doing this kind of little mini project 
to show how indigenous people supported their, their life ways with the three sisters. This is a, a little, this is a picture of what it looks like. While I'm at this point, this is another nice picture of various flint corns which uh, were developed in this time period and uh, became colonially recognized. The harvesting strategies are important as well, and that's something that people uh, need to understand. Because we, we understood uh, the growth patterns of plants, everybody thinks everything was late fall, and we didn't really eat corn in what we call in the milk. We used the corn, we, hard corn, because we made flowers and we ground that up, and it was hulled for winter storage. So the idea of corn on the cob with, and with butter was not really a part of one of our agendas. It was always to get it to that point of its fullest nutritional value. And we always allowed the, the earliest uh, on the stock to be left on there to fully ripen so that it would be the replanted uh, product for our, our next spring. And if you think of that strategy, it's pretty good because the earliest part of the corn that developed and was uh, ripened, obviously it was going to be pushed the calendar back a little bit on how long that, uh, how long it would take to grow. So selectively using the, the best years was always important. Winter storage, um, we also had words for putting corn into the ground and people think that means we're sowing it. And that isn't true. That was, it was an idea that we were putting into storage in caches were made of woven sacks and uh, in birch bark lined pits. And these kinds of techniques, my father documented back into the 1930s that they were still doing this in 1930, storing food in the ground, in, in caches. And as a child in the 1930s, he was well uh, assimilated into, uh, into the dominant culture. For him, it was surprising to see that they were actually still in Canada uh, putting foodstuffs in the ground in, in this state. And with that, I guess we're ready for questions. So folks, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. And um, I don't know if any of us here have questions to kick it off, but. I'd just like to offer um, that children and people can learn how to garden on their own at home. Um, and they can do it relatively on an inexpensive, in inexpensive ways by using recycled materials for planters and collecting the seeds from foods that they currently eat now. We always try to go grow organic, you know, non-GMO foods. However, not everybody has access to that. And so um, we encourage people just to try to grow food on their own, um, even if it's something small in a container in an apartment on your windowsill. Great. So we do have a couple questions coming in here. Um, let's see, they're moving faster than I can keep up with. Um, <laughs> so how does one get access to the website and information shared in the webinar? We will send an email to everyone who registered for the webinar and it will have a recording of the webinar and a link to where that will be posted. Um, so someone also said they missed the introduction. Um, can, can you repeat who you are and, and where you're from? Um, my name is Denise Puglio, and I'm the Sagamo Squad, the Kawasak Band of the Penacook Gabnaki people. And I'm Paul Puglio, the Sagamo of the uh, Kawasak Band of Penacook and Gabnaki people. And that, those two titles we gave you represent head female and head male speaker for the, for the group. So we have a question about, do we have detail, um, more detail on how the fish fertilizer was made? The, the fish fertilizer, because we, we were hunter-gatherers and fish, we didn't get into the fish. The fish is really another whole uh, webinar if you want to do fish. But the fish, it, when we would process fish, any of the unusable product would have been put in the ground raw like that. It wasn't uh, fermented. It, was, it just naturally was broken down by the earth and the uh, microorganisms. Uh, I'm sure... We didn't, uh, we didn't process it, if that's what you were wondering about. 
We literally, uh, any fish remains would just be put into the earth uh, deep enough so that the roots would extract the nitrogen as the, uh, the protein broke down. Basically, what he's describing would be a long, thin strip of a compost pile that you would then heat dirt over and plant your seeds in. And the nitrogen from the, break, the fish breaking down would um, feed, the fit, feed the plants, but the heat during that process will also um, help germinate and uh, help the seeds grow faster. Great. Um, so someone's asking if there's um, any projects like this being implemented in Massachusetts. I'm sure there are, but uh, I couldn't give you any specifics. <clears throat> I know the other, there are several travel groups in Massachusetts that uh, have similar projects. Uh, depending on where you live, you could probably, if you live out in the Seeds were historically saved from squash varieties. Was it encouraged for squash to cross-pollinate and adapt to the climate? Good question. Um, just like anything you do at home, I mean, we do it today. You, you harvest the, uh, the, the best looking uh, fruit. You do take the seeds and dry them. There is a kind of a rule of thumb. You shouldn't take just one. Uh, what you should do is always uh, selectively have several so that you have some diversity in the event there's some genetic trait that you don't like that comes out of it. And I think we've figured this out uh, over time that you just don't use one ear of corn or one squash. You take selectively a, a handful of them, you dry the seeds, and you... I don't know if we understood cross-pollination in that sense exactly. I think uh, most squashes uh, could cross-pollinate, but I think, I think we probably were excited about differences if something happened uh, strange. And we'd probably try to foster that if it was something that improved the variety. Um, another question here about um, some suggestions to approach uh, their local indigenous tribes to help share their knowledge. Do you have any suggestions? Ask. You got, you've got it's very read. simple. Pick up the phone, make a phone call, send an email, and ask. Um, a lot of indigenous groups are willing to share the knowledge that they hold, but they have to be approached first. Um, and you also have to be patient because we're busy people. So we, don't, we can't necessarily work on your time schedule. So as long as you're patient and um, you're willing you know, to ask, I would reach out. And if you're looking for the groups in your area, um, check out your local um, uh, Commission on Native Affairs in the state where you live, and they should have a list of the tribes that are in your area. Great. Let's see here. Um, can you suggest resources for teachers to use on teaching about indigenous plants? That is actually a topic that we're currently working on at UNH. Um, we're developing K through 12 curriculum to teach indigenous knowledge, not just in plants and gardening, but through all aspects of indigenous life. Um, so that's something that um, is gonna be forthcoming uh, in New Hampshire. However, I do know that there are other groups that have already established some curriculum, um, but I do not believe there is any one particular website where you can go to. So you would have to seek out um, that knowledge from each individual tribe. Okay. Another question here, um, is there an app that will tell me what wild edible vegetables and fruits are in my area? Hmm. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm one that's kind of computer illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of obvious that most of the things, you know, we, we talked about some of the wood lilies and, and things like that, which are a little harder. And I don't really encourage you to wild forage plants that may be endangered. Uh, but I'll tell you this, that the uh, sunchokes are, uh, if you find a patch of them, they're never going to be endangered. Uh, we, we, we have a raised bed and we started off with like a couple of dozen uh, of the uh, tubers. And within one year we had a thousand. And, but I would, I would say you can wildcraft a lot of things. Uh, we do mushrooms, but 
a lot of these things, you got to be well educated before you go out in the field. And we don't really like to just say, just go out in the field and harvest stuff. You could, you could find yourself eating the wrong things. It looks like a blueberry, but it's poisonous type of thing. And so we're always worried that people take this stuff too literally. And uh, I would strong you to, you know, you can educate yourself on the internet to what you can find in your own area. Uh, let's see, do you have any information about irrigation techniques and moisture retention in cultivated gardens? Well. Well, traditionally we planted in the lowlands along the rivers, so we tended not to have those issues. Yeah, looking at most of the gardens, none of them are really highlands. They seem to be all along the, the rivers as intervales or naturally occurring things because these rivers weren't dammed in those times. And you know, each spring there could have been new fields created along the Merrimack. And when we looked at the history of Concord, uh, the Concord, uh, you know, Merrimack through Concord changed dramatically from from different decades. So we think that uh, these things would have naturally occurring with all the silt in, in the good topsoil be washed down uh, the river and creating these locations. So I, I think we uh, we were never really worried about actually uh, maintaining the moisture level. Uh, I think the uh, critical thing is the mounds and the way they're shaped uh, allows the runoff to collect and the leaves collect moisture. And the whole, the relationship between the corn and bean and squash, one gathers the moisture and it drips, you know, off the leaves and you have moisture and dew and things like that. So there's, there was a strategy, it just evolved, so to speak. Hopefully that answers the question. That's great. We still have a few more minutes. If folks have other questions, feel free to, to type them in. We have another question here about the White Farm, and it says, uh, more recently, uh, New Americans started growing produce across the street, and certainly would love to learn about the, the weeds, I guess, is what they're talking about. The sun chokes. Sun chokes. Uh, this, is just, this is just a random thing we, we suddenly discovered. It was in the fall. We, we tried to look at where there's various places. We live on the, uh, the Sun Cook uh, River watershed, and we looked at a lot of the farmland along you know, Sun, uh, Sun Cook, and we noticed that these different places where we have now big cornfields. We started to look around the perimeters, and we'd see what they didn't plow and turn over, and that's where we'd find these indigenous plants, which probably go back a thousand years. I mean, we, we don't really do any genetics on, on the wild stuff, but we're not sure how far back that was going on. So if anybody wants to uh, buy or get into sun chokes, you can find them right now in the grocery stores as well, and you can try it, but treat it like you would mint or any other uh, very aggressively growing plant. Put it in some uh, soil that's very uh, rich and with a lot of moisture, and you will have yourself uh, some wonderful plants, and you can harvest them. But be forewarned, um, our sun trope to sun chokes grow to approximately 15 feet tall, and they need full sun. They need full sun. So make sure you have the appropriate space. Great. Um, Lana, did you have anything you wanted to add, or any questions or answers to any of those questions we listed? <clears throat> Am I able to talk? Yes. <laughs> um, so I actually put the link there for everybody on our website, um, indigenousnewhampshire.com. <clears throat> we have uh, a set of generously donated by Paul and Denise Pulu, a set of recipes um, of indigenous foods that one can um, you know, try at home. Um, one could also be creative and add some of the contemporary, you know, butter and sweets to them. Um, but some of our collaborative collective members have, have cooked some of those recipes and they're pretty cool. Um, I would like to um, ask Paul to talk a little bit about fish. I think uh, just because uh, we, our uh, collective, uh, majority of people in the collective located in the seacoast area. And I think food is one of those important um, uh, uh, so sources that that one can elaborate on a little bit more. Okay, um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions that we may be able to answer in the time period. Uh, the fish, we really believe that the, the the majority of our protein 
came from uh, fish resources. Fish migrated uh, from the earliest uh, ice out to the first ice formation. And we called fish like uh, the earliest uh, smelt were called winter fish, as well as the tom cod, which came at the ever extreme of the season. So fish became a protein resource that pretty much until everything got really frozen over and uh, it, it was available. And if you look at that strategy of following fish migrations, you, you had a, a very wonderful uh, diet. You think today about the omegas and the salmon and all that stuff, which we, we say we want to eat paleo. The paleo ended with the grains and people don't realize that grain does not fit into the paleo construct of what a paleo diet was. That's why we say it was the beginning of the end for us because fish with the strong omega uh, profiles, especially the salmon, the trout, and all those migratory fish were wonderful for us. And the ones we didn't use for food became our fertilizer and it, it's self-explanatory. But that's another whole hour of discussion about that. And uh, hopefully that answers or it filled in that little gap, but it, it's an important thing. People think we hunted moose and deer and bear all the time, but that was part of the protein stream, but the fish uh, was a major community involvement. Making wares and, and netting and all that stuff is part of our culture, especially along the coast where we could have taken capitalist, uh, capitalized on the opportunities of beached whales and porpoise and things like that. There was a lot of things that would wash up on the shore uh, that we could also have. So, so there are different strategies that we have uh, about how we filled in our protein uh, niches, if you want to call it that, for oils and fats. Paul, and Denise, there is a question um, about the uh, federally recognized or state recognized tribes in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Okay. We, uh, our tribe is on record with the Bureau of Interior through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We are, um, we are in a, what you call a status of petition, but we are not recognized by the, the uh, state or the federal government. We are, we are considered a pre-constitutional tribe uh, before the constitution. Our involvement with the federal government and the state was uh, back in Washington's time period. And we're somewhat happy that we're not involved in the politics of uh, being in a, a federally recognized tribe. Uh, we're still protected by law and the uh, state knows we're here. And it is the Cossack Band of Penneco Kanabnaki people. We're on record with the Secretary of State in the AG's office in the state. Right. You can find our website at kawasuk.org. That's C O W A S U C K dot org, O R G. And if you are a Facebook follower, we have a um, very extensive Facebook page which covers all kinds of indigenous activities in the country. We're like a, uh, a network of uh, resources if you look at us on Facebook. So look up Kawasak Band uh, of the Pentecook Abneki people on Facebook and you'll find a lot of resources there as well. See the words Kawasak, Pentecook, and Abenaki have an English translation? Okay, good question. Um, what does what these names mean? We never use them until colonial contact. Uh, we call ourselves human beings. We were one extended family of people. Uh, people can't wrap their heads around that because the colonials always looked for a king or a queen or a leader. We we're matriarchal. We were all extended families of grandmothers, daughters, and granddaughters, and all these tribal names that you see today, they were given to us by the Bureau of Ethnology, uh, Smithsonian. Uh, as they were trying to document the disappearing people, they put place names on all of us. We find it offensive, but we are obligated to work with the state and federal government using place names, which were never part of our culture. My father and grandparents said we never used any of these names that you use today. Uh, this is a colonial construct that was imposed on us that they felt we came from one place and only one place. Uh, if you're a U.S. citizen and a U.S. citizen, now it would be like saying what town are you from and that's what we're going to call you. That is not the way we looked at ourselves, if that answers that question. What's the word? The words, what, Kowasak, 
<clears throat> means the place of white pines. And we've done some research in their intervales with large stands of white pines, hence why you call Coas County. That was uh, an area along Connecticut and up into the, uh, into the upper watershed of the Connecticut, there were pine trees. And that was kind of a locus of where we came from, uh, upper Connecticut and uh, the Coas County is obviously still named that today. Hopefully that answers that question. Great. Um, let's see, yeah. All right, we have one. Living in a current capitalistic society, how can farming for profit as well as for education be respectful to our earth and indigenous peoples and history? This is an interesting one. We, we were at a conference for the last two days at Dartmouth, exactly on food uh, sustainability. And different tribes have different approaches. And we were fascinated to find that some tribes are extremely proactive in trying to cover their food ways from uh, birth to finished product, including everything from controlling their own grains and feedstock for their, for their cattle and their bison to the whole processing of it to the point where they don't allow anybody to process their food because they want ultimate in total control that it's pure and clean. And they admitted to us that they, they don't wanna use these organic or naturally grown or grass fed because they do everything they can to make it pure and clean, but they're not playing into the construct of what is organic, what is, you know, what is uh, uh, non-GMO. They do their best to make sure that the environment is uh, protected and their resources from, like I say, from the cattle feedstock is all maintained by them, and they are quite proud of the fact they control every aspect of their food waste. So it can be done. It can um, be it's done. Just, it's a matter of figuring out what exactly you want to um, capitalize on and um, figuring out the best ways to do that. And this tribe actually has their own casino, and they, they don't take outside. They actually use that food in their casino. So it, it's like... Even their public, even their, their elders, everybody is fed from the same food uh, environment that they've created, and it's a wonderful concept. There was a Quapa Nation. They're, they cover the corner of Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas. Arkansas, uh, the Quapa. If you look them up, you'll find that they are just a fascinating uh, tribal entity that is doing a wonderful job with their food waste. I think we've answered um, all of the questions that have been typed in so far. Um, is there any, are there any events or ways that people can get involved um, in work that you're doing or anything you want to share about events coming up? Well, if you go to indigenousnh.com, um, there is a list of events that um, our collaborative gets involved in. Um, as far as tribally, uh, you can find all our postings on Facebook. That seems to be the fastest and um, the best way to reach out to us. You can always message us, messenger us on Facebook as well or send us emails. This is an interesting subject matter. Everybody's interested in food waste and I don't think a week goes by when there's not another conference or another uh, thing like this webinar coming up. Uh, all you can do is keep track of us on Facebook and we try to keep posting what's happening. There's quite a few events, I think, that are coming up in the next few months that may be of interest, but, you know, being a seasonal thing about growing, uh, we take the opportunities. This is a time period to talk about food waste. Right. Um, the question popped up that said, what is the Facebook page name? It's Kawasak Band of the Penacook Abnaki People. If you just type in Kawasak and Penacook, it should pipe up. It should pop right up. And we'll try to get that link this is, in there. This language, yeah. Um, oh, someone asked about the language. The language, uh, we, okay. <laughs> Trying to catch up on all the postings here. <laughs> someone asked about language. Uh, what was the language question? I think it was about pronunciation. Of oh, pronunciation? Uh, oh. Uh, unless you're fluent in a language, it's kind of difficult to to go over that. We didn't spend any time on all of the Abnaki words for all of the, uh, we, we, this wasn't a language lesson. We wanted to show you the connection between our language and our culture that if we 
had it in our language, then we know we actually uh, harvested or, or ate those particular things. So when we look at that, we, the way we can roll back the clock is to look at our language and see what else was in there. I want to say a sentence or two in the language so they can at least hear it. Oh, they want to hear something? Yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> we, we do a universal kind of a greeting, and it's kwai kwai, ngwed kamit, gozawak, to nidlbak, to alnumbak. What it is, it's a connective sentence, and it says, welcome, friends and family, and all you others, alnumbak, human beings. And the connecting words is ta, which is like our word for and. It's a very fluid, very descriptive, and um, kind of rhythmic uh, language. It kind of flows like poetry. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll just mention that the New Hampshire Food Alliance hosts webinars once a month, and they're always free. Our next webinar coming up is on June 11th, and we're featuring Ian McSweeney of Agrarian Trust and he's gonna be presenting about the creation of a local agrarian commons. So check out our website and you can register for that. If you have any questions, feel free to email us or type it in the chat. Like I said, we're recording this and so um, that will be available to you when we email it out. Um, and thank you all so much for being on the, on the webinar today.